Okay. Slav, uh, we can't hear you, but James, you can hear me. Yes, I can. Okay, perfect. Uh, so welcome. Where are you now at the moment? Yeah, uh, Phoenix, Arizona. Oh, okay. Yeah, and you? I'm in Germany. Yeah. It's getting dark outside. Yeah. <laughs> are, are you, do you hear me now? Yes, we do hear you. Yeah, that happened. I've seen this happen on another session that uh, people were coming in and out. Okay, so James, you are still... Yep. Uh, we can see it. Okay, perfect. So let's hope that we will stay all um, unmuted when the next people no. arrive. Well, ju just in case, uh, I just logged off uh, and, and logged in again. Okay, thank you. And I that's think also we may want to keep muted because there is echo. James, you are somewhere where there is daylight. Correct. Uh, Phoenix, Arizona. Oh, well, it's just uh, an hour's difference from where I am. Yeah. I'm in, in, I, I'm in California, in Berkeley. Okay. In Berkeley. Yes. Know it well. I uh, spent uh, about 20 years in the Bay Area. Okay. Yeah. How, how, does it, how does Arizona compare to Bay Area? Oh. Hot? Yeah. Right? Yeah, we're up in the hundreds today, yes. Yeah. Very good. Uh, we have uh, other people, I think, scheduled, right? So, what, yes. what, James, Actually, what brings you to, to this meeting? Uh, sorry, I missed that. What, what brought you to this meeting? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, a friend of mine, futurist Benjamin Butler, had been working with uh, Frank um, for a number of years. I participated in the last one in, in March. Um, so... Um, I've done quite a bit of work in the social impact and climate change world mm -hmm. over time. Um, and, uh, yeah, interested to see what, what to learn from this. It's a pretty, uh, difficult question. If we can figure this question out, um, you know, I think ahead of the game in a lot of ways, um, fairly challenging, but here's to hear what everybody has to say. Okay, great. Uh, we are now waiting for Gary, uh, Gary Shapiro, and we, unfortunately, we cannot talk today with Chao Jin because she informed me that she um, got ill, so she's not uh, able to join us today. Um, and we have a guest, uh, a listener, Vicente Macias. Hi, hello, welcome. Mm, well, because we don't have a lot of time, I, uh, I feel a bit, it's a bit confusing that we have a, a backslash somehow of audio. Is it possible to mute yourself when you are not speaking? Or at least when you're not using headphones? Hello, uh, Gary. Hi, welcome. That was an experience. I had to download Chrome. I had to set all this stuff up, a password and everything. And... It's quite an effort to get on here. Yes, it's a bit challenging. <laughs> but it's Hi, worth hello. it. It's worth it. Yes, I hope so. Okay. <laughs> so uh, now we are um, complete, actually, because uh, our um, first, uh, our uh, participant number four, Chao Jin, cannot join us today. So um, we can start. Um, the session is about the next crisis. No one saw it coming. So um, taking the experiences we uh, made with COVID pandemic, we are still in, um, what experience or what makes us uh, uh, be prepared for the next uh, crisis? So have we learned something in, for example, using foresight methods or foresight activities or strategic thinking um, and for this, I would uh, now as a starting point, um, would like to ask you to invite you to say a few words about yourself. And then, of course, 
a couple of words and some ideas you uh, brought to this session today about um, what could be possible ways to be prepared uh, for the next crisis. I would like to start uh, with James. James, please. Uh, we are muted now. Here we go. Uh, so James Nusa, I'm in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, I have been doing a lot of work in uh, climate and sustainability, um, as well as um, corporate consulting on strategy um, over the years and have a technology background, uh, as well as um, you know, keep fairly current with uh, many of my futurist friends. Um, you know, I'd say there's, you know, many kind of tried and true foresight uh, methodologies. Um, I think what maybe hasn't been built into a lot of them in the past has been um, the speed um, of, of multiple crises. Um, and I think that, um, you know, in addition to uh, teams that are built and ready for Uh, deployment, basically, um, you know, disaster response, crisis response teams, not in crisis communication, but more on, a, uh, I think, a logistics and a um, business continuity perspective. Um, you know, those are some keys. Um, I think that also, you know, some of the newer technologies, AI, quantum um, computing, um, might be built um, as we go forward. Uh, to model some of these more sophisticated multi-crisis uh, types of scenarios as they come. And I think some of these are are probably more predictable than the current crisis that we have in the, the global shutdown. Um, but I think the imagination of what to do and the, and the impacts on businesses, um, you know, some areas to look at in this conversation. It's great to be here. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, then, Gary, please, would you like to introduce yourself and raise your points? Okay. Um, I'm on, and I suggest those that aren't turn off the microphone. Thank you. I'm Gary Shapiro. I am president and CEO of the Consumer Technology Association in the United States. We're based in the Washington, D.C. area. Uh, we represent 2,000 technology companies from the largest that you'd recognize, like Apple and Sony, to the smallest. 80% of our companies are small business. We also represent uh, disruptive companies, a whole bunch of them in different areas uh, like Airbnb and Uber and things like that, um, Pandora, um, as well as uh, others in the exercise field. Uh, so we, we are um, out there. We own and produce the CES, which is the world's largest innovation event. Uh, I've been very focused on innovation my entire career. I've written three books and over a thousand articles on it. Um, I, I like to call myself a futurist. I want to get that heading. I want to figure out how to be cool and call myself that because it's there. But what we, our own experience, um, first of all, I've been talking about pandemics publicly for several years as, as a risk. So I guess I saw it coming a BBC reporter actually played a recording for me recently when he interviewed me six or seven years ago, uh, where I talked about the concern I had for the events world uh, on that pandemic. So pandemic was not out of the question. We've certainly had enough of them. I think the what I was more sensitive to, and I got a lot of this from my wife, who's a surgeon, uh, in January, she, she hit the alarm bell as hard as she could hit it. And she even attended one of my uh, senior meet meetings in February with uh, CEOs in Florida the first week of February, and she just said, you guys are in denial. This is Kubler-Ross stages of denial. This is the biggest thing to hit our lives, February 2020. It's going to disrupt uh, supply chains. It's going to affect the stock market. It's going to cause social unrest, and you have to prepare and change everything you're doing. That helped us, actually. Uh, we, were, we were transforming by February. Uh, our building, we started doing practices to work from home. We, we did it well before we had to. And we also planned early. So by early March, we had decided on a strategy of um, our own for our own and where we defined our two big objectives, which was to, um, number one, focus on our biggest event, CES, and prepare for a digital 
only version. In any case, go to a hybrid approach uh, and also to focus on shifting everything we're doing. So we served our members needs in terms of information about the uh, pandemic, what we could do. And we ended up um, working with the White House to develop a website. We developed all sorts of tools. We focused on telemedicine. Uh, we promoted the heck out of that so people would shift to it and make sure there weren't barriers in place for that. But I think that the biggest learning from from it is is not something that's new and certainly didn't come from me, but it is that you can prepare all you want, but then you have to be flexible when you hit the battlefield. And there's other ways of saying that. Uh, another way of saying it is, um, you know, a takeoff on it's not the strongest that survive or the fastest that survive. It's those who adapt the quickest. I think you have to adapt quickly. And I think that's, that's number one, you adapt quickly. I have never, <laughs> since early in my career, I've been a fan of five-year plans and, and strategies and business plans. What we have done for a long time is we create like a two or three page outline document of what future we want. And then we develop the strategies along the way to get there. We certainly don't develop the tactics and we aim towards our strategies. And that's allowed us to grow as an organization, to grow our events around the world and to be the largest technology association in the world in a way. And also set out strategies. We also said what we don't want to be, which is really very important. And that that's helped to define, you know, I always admire Michael Dell and Brian Roberts of Comcast because they always say no to me for everything I ask, but, but they're staying within their lane and that allows them to, um, they respond, which is appreciated by people like me, for famous people like them, that they respond immediately. But they always say no, and, and I respect that because what they're doing is they're saying no quickly, but they're also defining what they're good at. And I've tried to take the same approach. We say no to a lot of things, but we, we go on a, on a path and we adapt quickly. Like once, once things change, we move so fast. And we have to take a staff that produces a largest physical business event in the world and we had to shift it literally overnight to produce a non-physical event, a digital event. And it was so difficult. Uh, but we did it, and it worked out fine. That, and now we're preparing for a hybrid event in January. And we have companies signed up and excited, at least in the United States, to see each other. Sorry it took so long. Thank you. Thank you. Um, very interesting. Although I will uh, later come back to your um, idea of uh, developing a vision um, instead of several scenarios, uh, a vision where you want to be, when you want to head for, to head for. Um, so now we have Slav here. Slav, please. Hello, welcome to uh, this panel. Um, I'm very happy to be in. It's a diverse group. Uh, I am an engineer. I'm in Berkeley, where I'm also a professor. So being an engineer, I believe in numbers. And being a professor, I like slides. So I have actually three slides to show you to set up the framework from the way I see it. And uh, uh, that's, uh, it's all about numbers. So uh, one big question about extreme events is how often do they happen? And uh, that has been studied quite a lot. And this is chart shows you a distribution of uh, frequency or probabilities of uh, uh, standard and poor drawdowns, daily drawdowns over the last 50 years. And as you see, everything is very nice, very uh, well behaving. It's a fat tails, but that's not that important until this happens. And these two events, uh, one is uh, March, uh, eight, I mean, October 87, and the second is March 2020. And they are from totally different universes. They don't fit the prediction. Uh, and they came known as Dragon Kings because they seem to be from another universe. Uh, so the problem is that these rare events are very difficult to quantify in terms of how frequently they occur. Uh, but in some ways, even the events that are in a way predictable cause a lot of problems. One example is something that we've all seen, the Deep Horizon blowout. This is not a rare event because over the last 50 years, there was about one blowout a year uh, on the, on, in this industry and about one uh, accident per five years when there were fatalities. And yet BP said it's not going to happen on our watch in our company. And it did. And the result was 11 people dead 
and some $65 billion uh, liabilities. Why? Because it was not considered feasible to uh, do some preventive stuff because they cost money. So this was a failure of the narrative and the consideration. And the last thing I want to share with you is a slide uh, from just very recent uh, report by McKinsey on uh, risks, but particularly the top part. In the top part, they showed financial crisis, uh, the uh, military conflict and pandemics that caused trillions of dollars. But notice these gray ones are those that has not happened yet. And that's a super volcano, extreme pandemic. Presumably what we've seen last year is not that big a deal, according to them. And some of those like uh, Earth being hit, hit by a, uh, a planetoid or something like this. And these would be tens of trillions of dollars. So the question is, how do we deal with this where we have very little understanding about the frequency of occurrence. And moreover, we typically neglect to think about consequences. Oh, this is just going to be something we can handle. So that's about it from me for, uh, for, uh, for now. OK, so thank you very much. Um, what you just showed us is um, really the point that we have experienced um, crisis uh, and crisis in different on different levels in different regions of the world of course and um, what you just showed us uh, is something in foresight in futures thinking uh, we call wild cards so we develop uh, scenarios different alternative scenarios which are not predicting the future but show the, the space of possibilities and these scenarios have to be robust. Uh, so the different factors have to fit together in each of the scenarios. This is a, a work uh, to be done. And this is usually called environmental scenarios because it describes the environment, which is not directly, um, um, well, uh, you cannot directly influence or control this environment, but you can, of course, control your own activities. And here you need your vision. This is what um, Gary just mentioned, the desired future. So, so on the one hand, you have a vision, uh, what you expect from the future, what you prefer, uh, also what you want to avoid. And then on the other hand, there are a lot of uncertainties. And some of these are predictable, but at the end, even the predictable aspects, like for example, things you can calculate are depending again on societal, economic, political developments, which interfere in one way or the other. Then we have uh, regional, global, international um, aspects and so on. So the complexity of this future can be somehow managed by analyzing it systematically. And still we are not able to predict it. But uh, the question is, how can we use the knowledge we receive from these activities to be better prepared? And um, I think there is maybe um, a gap I would like to address now in the discussion between knowing about possible futures and then being able to adapt quickly, as what Gary said. Gary said for him, of course, uh, the operative um, approaches being able to act, to adapt to changing situations. But then you need at least the infrastructure or the resources uh, to do so. So so have you thought before about possible strategies for adoption if, if things occur? Um, Gary, when you talk about adaption, uh, you mean you are? I, I I expect it that you are not simply waiting that things happen, but you have some ideas of things which might happen. So you believe that you can adapt. The organization is able to adapt. It's a very interesting question, and I was struck by the last slide, and I was trying to figure out if there was an x-axis and a y-axis, or just just the y-axis. 
if the x-axis was likelihood of occurrence or not, or because it was just based on impact. I just wanted to get that question out if I can. Of course, You're it's a very good question. Uh, You're muted. You're muted. Slav, we cannot hear you. You have to press that little left corner. Uh, maybe. Oh, maybe okay, this I'll, happens. I'll, I'll uh, vamp while you try to figure that out. But what, what I'm um, struggling with is we're still in a situation of flux today. You know, uh, in the United States, at least, it appears that things are heading back to normal, but they're really not. They're heading back to a, um, a different type of environment. And that environment, and, and the other thing is, I don't know where this fits into your planning or chart, but there's something I'm perceiving of mass delusion that seems to be going on, where it seems that there's somehow a consensus emerging that despite the clear facts out there, we ignore them. The, um, the mass delusion of a year ago was that the Chinese played no role in getting this pandemic out other than monkeys. Now it's gone the other way now, at least in the United States, the sense is, oh, the Chinese actually did create this from by, by altering the virus intentionally. But we can't do anything about that. But, but there, there are things going on today which are clearly going to occur in the future. We know we are entering an extraordinarily inflationary period, but yet our market is in denial of that. I mean, the price of everything has gone up so high so quickly. Now, I know to go higher is increased, rate, but there's shortages of everything from chips to glass to lumber. And, and we have a labor disconnect in the U.S., which is extraordinary as people are not working for a variety of reasons. But we're not talking about that. And there's the, there's the liberal view and the conservative view of why it's occurring. But whatever, it's occurring. Um, and the fact is that when I talk to our members, their biggest concern is employees, distribution issues, there's ships, and now China's just shut down one of their major shipping yards because of this new variant of virus. The, the distribution channel is so challenged right now that to get a normal source of supplies in the United States for a whole range of things, including building a building with wood, is just phenomenal. So we're gonna have extraordinary inflation. We're building up extraordinary debt. There's are two immutable facts. And it's, um, the, yet Wall Street's going crazy. And for the Wall Street, for the profitability to continue, when, when you have increased labor rates and you have distributional challenges and shortages of products and chips and cars that can't be made, it's just, a, there's a mass delusion what's going on. So my role, and I just did this because we had a meeting of all our members today, is to say, here's what I think is happening to our industry and the environment. You have to figure out what you're going to do about it. Here's what we can do. I mean, we could help at the edges with legislation and policy and, and um, different things we do. But the reality is every company, every entity has to make their own decision about how they deal with the reality that's out there. And this isn't long-term reality. This is next year or two or three short-term reality with rising interest rates and things like that in the federal government that's, that won't be able to afford most programs in a matter of just a few years. I mean, so I don't want to be the uh, the person in the who's always complaining about everything, but I feel that way lately, given the fact that I just think that for whatever reason, a collection of social media and everything is that society has shifted to a social delusion and all the focus is on something which is, and I know uh, one of you is very interested, James, and you're very focused on climate change. Everything's focused on climate change. It's that something where we could have marginal impact and it'll take many, many years. And of course, we have to start now. We have to do what we can. But all the energy on changing things that are going to happen is sucked into one area, which is, and there's not a comparison of what you can have an impact on and do things about today in other areas. So there's not a balance of societal problems or even company problems. It's just like what happened last June in the United States and spread around the world a year ago was there was a focus on race. And now there's an intense, incredible focus on race. The, the, the pendulum has swung so far that it's it's beyond the pale. It's where we have a, a mayor in Chicago now refusing to, to meet with white reporters. We have you know people being out for racial things. I mean, it's just gone so beyond it. And it ignores and flies in the face of facts about things and proportionality of like how many, how many uh, black people were killed by white policemen last year, about a dozen. How many people, how many 
police killed other people a lot more and how many blacks were killed by other blacks, like tens of thousands. So we have real proportionality issues that no one can talk about anymore. And I think that's hurting strategic planning. It's hurting process and it's hurting business. So I probably got myself in major trouble by saying it that way. And all my facts are not precise, but the general view is there is we've lost all rationality and proportionality. Uh, thank you, James. Uh, sorry, <laughs> Gary. Um, James, I wanted to ask you now, because we have some questions also by our audience uh, raised in the chat uh, section. And uh, Gary mentioned already uh, the climate change as a challenge. And there has been a... there. Actually, there are two questions. One is about what are potential causes for the next crisis. And Sergei also, uh, well, explains that he, he believes that climate change impact could be a factor or a driving factor for a next crisis. And you said you are dealing with climate change or you are interested in climate change aspects or actions. What do you think about it? So I think that um, a lot of times, um, and I think the way that companies are planning for climate change, countries are planning for climate change, um, you know, it's generally 50 to 100 year horizons. Like it's a, it's a distant phenomenon right now. Um, but, you know, the truth, I talked about like kind of multiple um, crises happening. And you know, how that might affect supply chain, how that might affect um, socioeconomics. So um, it's not a stretch to think that we get hit, the US anyway, gets hit by, you know, 10 to 15 hurricanes um, this year, um, that there are torna tornadoes in the, the Midwest and drought um, all along the West Coast from Washington to you know, the, the Southwest. Um, and um, along with climate change, um, you've got uh, a lot of climate refugee issues. So um, that could strike uh, southern borders. We're seeing it in Europe now. Um, you know, some attribute to war, some attribute to economic situations, but a, a lot of that is attributable to drought and other things um, in the Middle East. So, um, You know, how does that affect um, uh, civil unrest? Uh, how does that affect uh, how to respond to, to border issues? How does that affect um, uh, logistical issues? Um, are all, I think, current versus, you know, 50 year out, 100 year out, um, and especially how to deal with, with, with multiple, um, you know, climate crisis, catastrophes, uh, disaster, let's call them disa natural disasters is, is generally how they're referred to. Um, mm -hmm. But how do you, you, you um, respond to multiple happening at once, um, let's say in a geographic region? How does that exp um, you know, affect your customers? How does that affect your supply chain? Um, mm -hmm. I, I think of. Um, and I think Slav has some expertise in this world as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, James. I think it's uh, very helpful uh, how you put it, um, that you uh, believe that the multiple uh, inter um, interrelations between these different uh, disasters, uh, th they actually bring all these problems we have. So it's not that we can just handle with one or two uh, uh, developments, but we are We are facing so many different activity, uh, so many different challenges um, due to climate change, natural disasters, uh, causing um, logistic problems, of course, migration, and taking into account that still uh, almost eight, 90 percent, as far as I know, of migration still happens in within the region where um, the problem occurs. So, so, and still we have these huge problems. Um, We have also some requests for microphones from our audience. Before I ask uh, Li Chu to join the uh, discussion, um, Slav, uh, yeah. do you want to add, add something, please? Yeah, thanks. Uh, I wanted to follow up and, and finally figure out that the 
IT is not the greatest because uh, I had to log out and then log in to to be unmuted. Uh, anyway, so they, they answered as to what that uh, is on the horizontal axis of the slide I showed, and that's the lead time. A lead time that can be years, can be months, or can be minutes. And that's, I think, very important for, for two reasons, because it follows to what Gary and what James were saying. First of all, there are certain things that we have to take care of now, but also some of these things that we have to start taking care of now will take a long time. Climate change, which I am very much involved in is, as, as, a, as a researcher, uh, it's going to happen uh, on the period of decades or more. So it is foolish to think that we will have time because this is like turning a huge uh, oil tanker. It doesn't turn on the dime. So that's one part. And the second one is, uh, Gary mentioned adaptability and flexibility. And, and that's indeed is a very interesting um, issue. And from my own perspective in education, we've seen this happening extremely, I wouldn't say well, but uh, in, in a way uh, surprising because when we were hit with uh, COVID, uh, well, nobody really thought about remote education on a scale that that occurred over the last year. And yet we all kind of jumped in uh, and use the technology that was available, and that's thank, thank goodness it was like a Zoom, uh, and it and it worked. Okay, we didn't really plan for any long-term remote education. As a matter of fact, there was this huge mental barrier among educators about professor uh, around professors that it's not going to work. Uh, now, of course, the problem is that what we have done is we took the uh, hundred year old pedagogical forms like the large lectures and we s stuff it into digital channels. Uh, we have to learn what we can do with this new technology. So that's going to take time. But I'm thinking that there are very positive aspects of adaptability and, and resilience as a society, at least some parts of it. So that makes me half optimist. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, thank you. And uh, also, thank you very much for uh, explaining that one of the axes is about time, uh, which leads us on the one hand to the duration of these events or of these catastrophes, but also to the time we need to manage it. And the crisis is usually also something which means the, the time to come back to a new normal after such an event. Um, so now I would like to invite our audience to um, uh, contribute and, oh, I hope she hasn't left uh, now because, no, here she is. Um, Li Chu, um, I'll try to manage to give you the mic. I hope it works. So I think now you can talk with us or speak. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, here you are. Hey. Welcome. Hi. Uh, hi. Hey, I have a, uh, first, I agree, uh, everyone's comments. I am, um, definitely, uh, concerned with the coming, maybe not a one or more, uh, crisis, different versions. Um, I'm just a little confused at the moment, uh, in US. I just left from Texas, um, here in Portugal right now. Um, so the consensus in US, of course, we're going to have a huge, um, unpredictable, uh, uh, inflation. However, in Europe here, people are more concerned about deflation. Um, in Asia, I believe majority people not even worrying about either way. So I don't know what's your um, take on on this kind of you know. I mean, every all the government issues of tons of money these days. So what's the uh, what what do you think on the differences among the continents? Thank you very much uh, for this question. Who wants to answer to this? Well, I maybe jumped in a little bit. Oh, am okay, I? Please. Okay, you can hear me. Yeah? Uh, mm -hmm. Well, I, I think uh, my my uh, friends in China are very much concerned about inflation. Uh, well, Gary made a, a very good point that we have inflation that uh, we only now seeing on a daily level, but we had inflation in uh, financial assets. 
uh, you know, think about Bitcoin that sucked tremendous amount of money that was printed. Uh, think about uh, stock market that sucked a tremendous amount of money. Well, that is inflation and housing, same story. And only, but this is not related to maybe everybody's daily life because not everybody has a Bitcoin. Uh, so it seems at least. Uh, but now when you have uh, and you want to buy a piece of plywood and it costs you twice as much as it was, now you see it. So I think the inflation is 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 kind of lurking uh, on the horizon, and it's now we see it in different different forms. Okay, thank well, I'm you. Not an economist, but um, mm -hmm. Gary, you are nodding, and you are muted. I was nodding in agreement. I mean, the inflation <laughs> is being is being felt differently. And it is, people are seeing it at the gasoline pump. Um, they're seeing it in higher prices for food. And it's real and it will be there. And we have essentially a whole generation of people that don't even know about inflation. They don't know about interest rates that are, under, that are over 4 or 5%. And it's going to be shocking, I think. Um, and and the, you know, the U.S. economy has been kept up by some, the federal the government is borrowing money from itself. I've never seen it. And we've been getting away with it for like 10 years now. It's incredible magic. I don't understand how it works. And I'm a, I have an economics degree, but it's working and it's helped the economy, but, but this it's not sustainable. Uh, and we're already seeing that the Chinese are not, are starting to cut back on their holdings of, of us debt. And, you know, we're in a very, I, I the problem with a lot of planning is the inflection points when, you know, you can always predict the trend will continue until it doesn't. And it's a matter of predicting when the trend will stop. And it's very difficult to do that. But I think interest rates are going to rise. Inflation is going to rise. Um, corporate profits are probably peaking because there's been so much money thrown in, into the economy. And we're going to face uh, a much more difficult and challenging situation in the next year or two. And, you know, that gets wrapped up in the politics and there'll be blame and the parties will fight. But meanwhile, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, we also have a very divided country, and, and I know this is a global thing, so I don't want to just focus on the U.S. I don't understand the deflationary concerns in Europe at all. Uh, I just don't get it. But right now, because of the pandemic, most people are focusing on getting through the next quarter, and that certainly is the incentive for the, for the corporate system right now is getting through each quarter or each month's numbers. Um, but, but as things change relatively quickly, as you know, there's there's talk today in the U.S. about you know oil prices hitting hundred dollars a barrel. There's there's things that there's gonna be a lot of sh uh, sticker shock, and that's why I I didn't mean to, in my comments to to say that the focus on climate change is improper. I mean that it should be weighed against everything else that we have to deal with, and, and, and companies are in the business world, and even our political world, and the economic world, and media seem to be gravitating from one huge crisis to another without putting things in proportion. And that's what I think we lack in a lot of our discussions about a lot of things is proportionality of risk, proportionality of likelihood, you know, all these different things that occur. And, you know, there is a bright future in my world. There's a bright future of self-driving cars and artificial intelligence and staying healthy longer and having all these miracles of technology making life better. And that's going to also produce a lot of economic uh, gain and produce jobs and make people healthier, live longer, safer, get educated, more customized, everything we want to do and, and stay connected with each other. So I think there is, there's positive things that are happening in the world, but there's some really strong forces now where we're just, I feel like we're the family spending on a like credit card and ignoring the reality of what's going to occur. We're not acting very maturely as a society, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Um, okay. And some of the reactions to COVID were just, inspiring. I would agree with that. We did bring out some of the best in humanity, but, but some of them were not inspiring at all. And especially with some of the, the debates going on in the U S about what the facts were. And, you know, we had our own challenges here, which I, it wasn't yeah. our finest moment. Okay. Thank you, Gary. Um, I, uh, I learned now that, um, yes, complexity is, is what we are all, uh, thinking about and, and trying to figure out on what we should concentrate uh, in our strategies and let it be even short-term strategies and adaptions to quickly changing environments. 
Um, so we are now uh, almost at the end of our session and I would like to ask you, uh, dear participants, to um, name the next challenge, the next, well, I wouldn't say crisis, but the next uh, risk and challenge, big challenge you see uh, you are now preparing for. I mean, we, we discussed, we mentioned a lot right now, financial crisis, uh, climate Uh, effects like uh, natural um, uh, disasters. But what is actually on your mind when you go back to your business tomorrow? Uh, maybe it's something you already mentioned, but what is what is the, the focus you have in your strategy at the moment? And I'm asking now ev everybody, uh, Slav, please first. Uh, that's my answer. Okay. This is something that we don't know that we don't know. <laughs> and that, that worries me. I think the, the big, big issue is that we uh, know about many things and we neglect them, but there is something uh, lurking behind. So the big issue is, is resilience, building the society, economic systems uh, and, and businesses to be responsive and resilient mm -hmm. leave that okay thank you uh gary please i uh i love what was just said in fact in my last book i talked about donald runfield's book and the known i spent several pages talking about known knowns and known unknowns it's just such a brilliant two by two chart that i think can guide us um but i think our our folk the next big challenge to me is going to be economic And that's what I think we have to prepare for financial, as I described. Okay, thank you. And James, what's you know, your... The, yeah, story? the resilience and response is, um, is certainly interesting. Um, I did notice, uh, you know, maybe across this, uh, Slav talked about the response of going from uh, typical lecture to online and... Um, And Gary spoke to how fast his team needed to move to a digital presence for, you know, one of the main parts of his organization's um, reason for being or, or a, a large part of his business. Maybe not reason for being, Gary. Um, I don't take that wrong. Um, better well-known part of his business, maybe. Um, and then I saw the cybersecurity on Slav's slide, uh, you know, multiple attacks and the the cybersecurity that happened today so uh, a lot of i think that way maybe what's not uh talked a lot about as well from this crisis is that massive um digital transformation that's happened um across businesses and it's fairly new um and i don't know that we've got the um system set up for that um relatively quick transition some say we've we've done you know five years in digital uh you know changes in behavior and infrastructure um in the last year um and i don't think that a lot of the the threats or that are associated with that um rapid rapid change um have been digested by and large right now i think the opportunity okay. has but not maybe the risks associated with it Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. We have also some comments from our um, audience here. Um, for example, uh, diversity? No. Uh, Lee Ju, would you like to? Yes, please. Um, hi, uh, so first, I'm a Chinese born uh, American. I grew up in China and then in China. Is there Please, uh, could, could everybody mute? Uh, because I, we have a back. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So I'm a Chinese American and I'm stuck in the middle of a US China trade war. Uh, everything I do is get, I mean, 90% of stuff I do get an impact in a better way. So um, at the same time, China has its own issue, have, you know, the rest of the world have different viewpoint to China now. And the US have, All the things Gary mentioned, I'm 100% agree. I'm a big believer of a, um, of a force turning. I believe you must be a, 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 a reader of that book as well. And then I'm extremely concerned 
but I don't know what's going to happen, how to predict. So I moved myself to Europe <laughs> so, because um, I assume if China.